The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of Gold Money. And with me on the line from Thailand, I'm very pleased to say, is Mark Farber, who is editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom and Doom Report. And you can find it on a website his website, which is gloomboomdoom.com. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, No, it's very much our pleasure. Um, You have a a long experience of financial markets. In fact, I can remember you speaking at a bank credit analyst conference in uh, Bermuda. I think it was in the very early 90s. Now, given this long experience, um, have you ever seen anything like today with money printing going out of control, uh, government's going bust and the banking system looking very, very um, dicey, to say the least. Have we ever, ever seen anything like this in your experience? Well, actually, I started to work in 1970, so I've been in this business now for more than 40 years. Uh, I see money printing repeatedly in countries that then led to very high inflation rates, like in Yugoslavia, in Serbia, in Zimbabwe in Latin America in the 1980s, in Mexico in the 1980s. So, yes, I've seen it. And uh, usually what happens is what also transpires at the present time, uh, the money doesn't flow evenly into the economy and the so-called Main Street or essentially the real economy doesn't recover but uh, people that have access to this created liquidity first and the institutions that have access to this uh, liquidity, they buy assets. And so you have, instead of a very high consumer price inflation, you have very high asset inflation. Eventually, inflation shifts, and it also goes into consumer prices. I think that's a very good description of the current situation, um, which really raises the question, uh, how long do you think it will be before uh, the effect of uh, monetary inflation on assets will start moving into um, ordinary essentials like food and, um, you know, and energy and things like that? Well, it, it's already moved. I mean, people say hurrah, the Dow and the S&P are making new highs. Today, i just like to point out that a lot of markets aren't making new highs. Emerging markets this year are essentially down 10% from their highs. So they rose in January and then they sold off already. And two, we have uh, also to consider that uh, since 2007, when the market peaked out at 1,500 I think it was 65 or 75, yeah, 65. Since then, the U.S. government's debt has increased by $7 trillion. And this doesn't include the unfunded liabilities that are growing by something like $5 trillion a year. And so this money that is essentially coming into the economy from the fiscal deficit boosts corporate profits. But you're borrowing essentially from the future and these debts will never be repaid, but the interest on the debt will over time increase, especially if interest rates one day are normalized. Secondly, the number of people on food stamps since 2007 has doubled, and the people with disability insurance has also gone through the roof because more and more people take advantage of the system. So... When people tell me, oh, everything is fine and the stock market is making a new high, I have to remind them that a lot of it is on borrowed money uh, and that uh, this liquidity is flowing at the present time in U.S. stocks. Before that, it flowed into oil and gold and other commodities. And so the cost of living of the ordinary people is going up more than their incomes And so in real terms, inflation for adjusted for inflation, the majority of people is much worse off than, say, five or ten years ago. Indeed. And I think uh, wages certainly haven't kept pace. And not only that, but the official rate of inflation is understated. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So the, the, the inflation rate 
I mean, we have to define what is inflation, but basically it's the cost of living increases. The cost of living increases are much higher than what the Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes. And I would estimate that the typical household in the U.S. has cost of living increases of something like 5% to 7% per annum. Yes, that's interesting, because if you apply that as a, as a more uh, sensible deflator to the GDP numbers, uh, actually the uh, economy, not only in America, but elsewhere, where inflation is understated, is actually contracting quite rapidly. Well, this is a very good point. That's precisely what is happening if the statistics were compiled in an honest way the economy is actually not growing at all. No, indeed. Move, moving on slightly, um, the Japanese situation, uh, it, I think, is getting rather worrying. And I'd be interested in your views because uh, they used to have a continual export surplus. Now they have an export, uh, um, a, a, a deficit on the balance of trade. People are blaming it on the Fukushima disaster, but that was so long ago, it's, that can't be true anymore. The savings rate is collapsing um, and uh, they are now trying to print their way out of difficulty. This is rather worrying, is it not, Mark? Well, basically, uh, there is this view that has come up in Japan that the problems are brought about by a very strong currency. I disagree with that view because uh, if you look at strong economies, uh, they usually had strong currencies and weak economies had weak currencies. But this is the view now. And so they embark on money printing, which in my view will make matters worse. But it may lift stock prices. But I think it will be very negative for the bond market eventually. Actually, I've just written about this, that it is... And you started the interview by saying, isn't that unusual what we're seeing nowadays? What is most unusual is actually that since they announced uh, money printing in Japan, a uh, Japanese JGB, in other words, the government bonds in Japan, have rallied this totally counterintuitive because one would think that if you print money, the bond market should immediately react negatively. But no, in the case of Japan, they rallied. But I think that uh, eventually Japanese bonds will tumble and that, in other words, interest rates will go up. And that will cause a huge problem for the government because the government debt is so high as a percent of the economy. Yes, indeed. It's something like a quadrillion yen, which is a, a, a staggering figure. Um, and, I mean, mo moving on to China. China, it seems to me, at least uh, the Chinese uh, citizens have got quite a high savings rate, um, which must insulates the Chinese, if you like, from the worst sort of depressionary forces that uh, the West is trying to stave off. Uh, would you think that's a fair, a fair assumption? Well, we have a high savings rate in China, but we have another set of problems. We have huge overcapacities that have developed over the years because uh, we had also an economy that was going into recession in 2007, 2008, and they had a massive stimulus package. And that has then created these overcapacities and also misallocation of capital, most notably into real estate. So I'm much more cautious about China today than, say, some of the more optimistic economists and strategists. And if you look at the performance of copper, and if you look at the performance of companies like Rio Tinto and BHP, which are down significantly from their highs, uh, the figures that China publishes in terms of economic growth do not add entirely. Secondly, China has trading partners. So if we look at the export and import figures of China's trading partners, we get a fairly good idea about how the Chinese economy is uh, performing. And these figures, in my view, published by South Korea, by Singapore, by Taiwan, are much more honest than the figures published by China. And so, in my view, the economy has already slowed down very considerably. Yeah, I think that, that, uh, that makes sense. 
Um, while we're trotting around the world, of course, the latest news really is Europe and particularly the Cyprus situation. Um, the, it seems to me that the um, uh, robbing the deposits was very badly handled and it set um, a few rabbits running, which might lead to people withdrawing funds from uh, banks in the other weaker nations. Uh, how do you see things in Europe generally? Well, first of all, about the banks, uh, I have always argued that, uh, you know, money in the bank under normal conditions is actually the safest investment uh, because you have uh, banks, uh, traditionally, they have a social function and the fiduciary responsibility, in other words, you deposit money in a bank and you expect it to come back one day when you demand it. But because banks have started... Uh, 15, 20 years ago to massively speculate with the depositors' money, it has gotten out of hand. And now the question is who pays for it? Until recently, after the crisis uh, broke out in 2007, 2008, it was mostly the taxpayer who paid. And now it transpires that also depositors will be asked to contribute to losses. Now, I have no objection. I am essentially, philosophically, I'm against a deposit insurance. Say you have 100 banks and you don't have deposit insurances, then you and I will choose a bank that is very conservative and will take the money away from the dangerous banks that have a huge uh, derivatives book that speculate in all kinds of uh, financial products and so forth. And uh, that's the way the free market would allocate capital efficiently. Now, we have these deposit insurances, but they now do not seem to be entirely uh, safe. And what also happens, and this we've seen in the case of Cyprus, let's compare two situations. You have a company. The company has $100 million dollars bond issue outstanding. And I own 10% of the, uh, say, of the bonds outstanding, and another uh, 100 people own the rest. And so if the company goes bust, the bondholders lose according to their percentage ownership. That is basically... In capitalistic society, the basic uh, premises of lending money to someone, they go bust. Proportionately, the losses are then shared. But in the case of Cyprus, the small depositors with less than 100,000 euros uh, seem now not to be touched, whereas a large depositor with $5 million or $10 million may lose, I don't know, 60%, 50%, whatever. And that, I think, is not fair. Yes, what, it, what they're doing is they're differentiating between creditors with the same rank, uh, which um, is not the intention, if you like, of uh, company law almost anywhere. But this is yeah, something... Absolutely. Yeah. But this is something um, which, which, which um, uh, I've looked into, and I find, actually, uh, that the BIS, uh, or rather the Financial Stability Board, which is a committee underneath the BIS... Uh, first put this forward in a paper back in uh, October 2011, um, uh, bringing in all creditors as a means of getting the taxpayer off the hook. And this was endorsed by the Cannes G20 summit the following month. And so, um, and what we're now seeing is that uh, this is being put into law where necessary in various jurisdictions. So it's not just Cyprus. If we have a bank failure anywhere, then uh, the uninsured deposits are effectively at risk and will be penalised uh, because they are above that certain limit. Now, surely this must, this must accelerate bank runs rather than give confidence, if you like, the confidence that's required to stop people withdrawing their money. Well, basically what it does is it forces people out of a conservative investment under normalised conditions, which is a bank deposit, into assets. So if I have, say, $100 million uh, with 
on deposit with the banks, then I scratch my head and say, well, maybe it would be better to have this $100 million in the stock market. The stock market may move up or down, but that all companies would go bankrupt and that I would lose in the long run 60% is not very likely. The market may go down 60%, but usually it then recovers. Or it may tell me maybe it's better to buy a Picasso or an Andy Warhol or maybe a, a vintage car or bonds, government bonds and so forth. So, so you understand, basically, the central banks, in my view, seem to force conservative investors to now do something with the money. Absolutely. And to what and extent... They, they've already done it through negative real interest rates. The negative real interest rate is an expropriation of decent people who have their uh, money, their savings with banks. Yeah, so there are two ways in which they are robbing the, um, uh, the depositors, as it were. The one is by... Uh, just literally taxing the uninsured depositors to um, turn that into bank capital. And the other is through uh, artificially suppressed interest rates, which um, is, if you like, dilution of money, uh, dilution, yes. therefore, of purchasing power of these deposits. So um, I take the point about uh, moving um, uninsured deposits uh, into um, other assets like markets or um, you know, stock markets or paintings or whatever. Um, oh, or, or property even. But presumably, um, this money is sitting there because it doesn't like the risk of um, uh, property or, um, you know, war holes or <laughs> whatever it might be. Yes, yes. But, but you understand, that's what I'm saying. In a traditional system where there is no money printing, bank in uh, money in T-bills and T-bonds and in banks, is essentially the most conservative investment. It doesn't give you a very high yield and high return, but it has low risk because you can deposit it at the beginning of the year and after three months you take it out. Uh, it's not subject to a huge price risk or price fluctuation. But in the current environment, the central banks are basically aiming at people taking the money from the banks and either spending it on something which boosts consumption, because I may say, okay, I have $100 million, then I'd rather go and uh, buy, I don't know, all kinds of toys from Apple iPads to yachts or sail ships or God knows what, uh, or Ferraris, uh, then take the risk that the banks hold and I lose 60% of my money. Or I say, OK, then I put some in stocks and some in properties and some in bonds. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, I, but to... you understand, the yeah. governments are so vicious. Yeah. I believe that God attacks well-to-do people regardless. If Abs they can't take their money away from the banks anymore because they don't have much money in the banks left, they'll go after them in a wealth tax or very high estate duty. Yes, indeed. And the other, of course, the other uh, um, cherry sitting there waiting to be picked, I suppose, are pension funds as well. Well, you see, this uh, for sure. But they have to be a little bit more careful with the pension funds because the pension funds are essentially the people that benefit from the pension funds are the masses. In other words, the workers and the government officials a very large portion of pension funds are state pension funds, the teachers and the policemen and the firemen. And so forth. It's more difficult to take that money away than to take it away, say, in America. I'm talking here about uh, the financial wealth. Yeah. 92% of financial wealth in the U.S., in other words, bond stocks, cash is owned by 5% of the population. So 80%, uh, 90 percent, uh, 90% of the population has essentially practically no financial assets. That's why a rising stock market doesn't lead to a necessarily strong economy because most people don't own stocks. Yeah. So to take it away from these rich fat caps that we are perceived to be, and I admit we benefited from money printing because we have financial assets and we have real estate and we have paintings and so forth. 
But the temptation in a democracy where you have far more people that have nothing than the few people that have the wealth is very high to take it away eventually from the people that have wealth. That's why Mr. Obama got elected a second time, because he went to the people that get food stamps, he went to the people that get disability insurance, that are on pensions, and uh, unemployed, and said, look, we have a problem. Why? Because these rich people take your money. Right. No, that's that. That makes sense. So, I mean, do you think that uh, this uh, move to tax deposits might um, set about a change in preference between money and goods in favour of goods? Because that uh, surely would would accelerate the rate of inflation and bring about uh, and necessarily a rise in interest rates, which would expose the bankruptcy of the banking system and governments. Well, let's put it this way. I mean, I know a lot of well-to-do Jewish people. They own properties, they own gold, physical gold, and interestingly, they own a lot of painting and art. Because, you understand, it's easier to take money away from financial assets than, say, from uh, the holders of paintings, unless you know, the tax collector goes into your house and checks every painting, but you could always claim, look, these are fake. Yeah. And so I think that uh, certain assets are less vulnerable to expropriation than others. Right. And uh, lastly, um, presumably, uh, over a period of time, precious metals would benefit from this, um, from the flight, if you like, out of deposits. Do you think that's going to be a factor in the prices of pr- precious metals in the coming in the coming months? Well, I'm glad you're asking. Basically, we have now very negative sentiment about gold, and practically every strategist and uh, bank and broker is, has gold on a sell signal. And uh, what I'd like to point out to is, yes, uh, since uh, October 2011, when the S&P was at 1,074, we're up 47% on the S&P, and gold had peaked out in September 2011, and we're down 18%. So stocks have grossly outperformed gold over the last two years. I admit that. If we go back to 1999, up to today, of course, gold has still vastly outperformed uh, stocks. Moreover, if I look at the gold bull market, 1970 to 1980, gold had uh, peaked out in December 74, and then it dropped into July 76 by more than 40%. At the same time, the stock market went up. The stocks over those two years outperformed gold by a factor of three. They were three times stronger than gold. But after gold bottomed out in uh, July uh, 1976, at $105, gold went up eight times. So if you ask me, Mark, what would you do if you received tomorrow a million dollars? I would be tempted to actually buy some gold and say the U.S. stock market is now the only game in town. I've seen enough get only games in town, like the Nikkei in the late 80s, yes. like uh, Nasdaq stocks in the late 90s, like housing in the U.S. until 2007, like commodities in 2008. I've seen so many only games in town, and they all come to a bitter end. Bitter. Absolutely. And so personally, I think that uh, if I had to make just one choice, real estate, equities, bonds, cash, gold, I think I would choose probably gold. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Um, Mark, I'm very grateful that you've taken time out. I know it's quite late in the evening uh, where you are. Um, so on behalf of, uh, of our uh, listeners, I'd very much like to uh, say thank you. 
And just to remind our listeners that uh, Mark can be found on his website, gloomboomdoom.com. Mark, thank well, you thank very you much. Thank you very much for having me on the program. That's our pleasure. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.